Welcome to a conversation about the Invisible College. My name is Douglas Gabriel, and I'm so glad today to have a discussion with our guest, John Barnwell, about the Invisible College and all of its different names and ramifications. Welcome, John. Uh, hello, Douglas. I'm just so thrilled because there's an article being posted in ourspirit.com, which is about the Invisible College. And it's a surprising article when you read it because it doesn't turn out to be quite what you would normally think was the Invisible College, especially if you're a historian like you are, John. So we're going to discuss the very widest parameters of what it means to study as a student in the Invisible College in all different uh, religions and traditions and esoteric philosophies. So that's the topic today, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce a little bit of it if you don't mind. That sounds good. Generally, the Invisible College can often be referred to as the Temple of Wisdom, and that goes back in tradition for a long, long, long time. It's also called, in Eastern tradition, Shambhala. It's where the Masters go to rejuvenate themselves. It can also be called the Realm of the Etheric, or Rudolf Steiner called it the Realm of Spiritual Economy. It's also called, in Theosophy, the Great White Brotherhood or the White Island, where you cross a bridge to this sacred island where all the wisdom is held in these libraries. Tibetan Buddhism calls it Tushita Heaven, and many of the different emanations of Buddha, wisdom Buddhas that teach, many of these uh, Buddhas teach, you go to Tushita Heaven, and there it is that you encounter these living etheric Buddhas, what we sometimes refer to as masters. In the Bible, it's referred to as the Seven Heavens, in alchemy, it's referred to as the seven planetary spheres. In theosophy, it's referred to in anthroposophy as the seven incarnations of the earth. We'll go into all of those things, but it's also called the halls of wisdom, the halls of learning, the mother lodge of humanity. All of these things refer to this most sacred place that is invisible. Somehow it's across that threshold between the physical and the spiritual. And when you go there, you learn you're with higher beings who teach you things. And that's why it's called a college, of course. But we're going to talk a little bit later in the conversation about the deeper ramifications of that. But as we know, the Invisible College in history was referred to by the founders of the Rosicrucians. And John, you might give us a historical introduction into that uh, as we discuss this sometime uh, later in the conversation. But this Invisible College that the Rosicrucians had was really part of the Protestant Reformation. They had to go underground to survive, and they kept the ancient Kabbalistic and alchemical and hermetic wisdom in these traditions, one of which was called the Unity Brethren. And it is out of that tradition and uh, Johann Valentin André that we get some of the three, that we get the three principal Rosicrucian works that then later went into what we even call today the Moravian Brotherhood. And some would say created the Royal Society in London with Robert Boyle and the other people who associated with Amos Comenius, the last bishop of the Unity Brethren, these Bohemian wanderers you've probably heard of, though that had this wisdom and they kept it on the Tarot cards. And so, John, your book, The Arcana of the Grail Angel, is all about the teachings, the inner mystery wisdom teachings that are found in the Tarot, and you use that as kind of a doorway to the Temple of Wisdom, I would call it. You don't, I'm not sure you call, that, uh, call it that in your book, but in a way, even the Tarot was used as a path to go into this invisible world to encounter spiritual beings that could teach you things about yourself and about the past, the present, and the future. So that's kind of a general introduction to it for anyone who doesn't know, and since this will be shared with all kinds of people, both in our circle of our spirit uh, followers and others. I wanted to give a general introduction so you know what it is we're talking about. So, John, where do you want to start to address the uh, historical ideas of what is the Invisible College? Well, that's, uh, it's such an uh, overlighting concept and brings in so many elements because really it has to do with the synthesis of the wisdom of humanity. So it is uh, truly all-encompassing. 
in that it represents those the input that we can receive from those great beings that are in advance of ordinary humanity, that have already graduated to what will be future stages of human evolution and represent uh, the great spiritual beings that are the guides of mankind. And so <clears throat> throughout history, there's been numerous characterizations of them that have tried to give somebody a concept in which to be in a state of preparedness. Uh, in the Grail tradition, it's embodied in the Grail castle, uh, but there's a great many different images, such as you shared, regarding Shambhala and uh, the Golden Island, and there's all these various characterizations. And... Uh, I think that, that probably is an introduction. It might be helpful if I share somebody from uh, one of the representatives of the Great Lodge, uh, Madame Blavatsky herself, H.P. Blavatsky, who founded the Theosophical Society. And she said, uh, the task of writing a true and real history of a secret occult society from its records, where such exist, is an impossibility. For even when such societies left reliable information of their pursuits, aspirations, and beliefs, the language employed has always been of such a character as to baffle entirely the ordinary exoteric reader, whether he were historian, literateur, or scientist. Such literature could be interesting only to the student on the track of esoteric knowledge, or to one as who has in a great measure acquired the meaning conveyed for himself in other ways. This method of giving to the world, as it were, the proceeds of lifelong research in the realms of unseen nature has been adopted by alchemists, magicians, priests, and hierophants from all ages. None but those who were sufficiently steadfast in the cause of truth could read and understand what was thus written. The numerous and minute directions for the working of spells and cures, etc., left by Paracelsus, and which are apparently as straightforward and practicable as the recipes in the modern cookery book, would turn out probably much less successful in the hands of an amateur, no matter how highly educated on the physical plane, than the more delicate dishes taken from such recipes manipulated by an entirely inexperienced servant. For these elaborate instructions are given in terms that appeal simply to the material senses of those who are in search of power rather than wisdom, whereas the real effort to produce the result has to take place on the astral plane of nature. The spiritual or soul side of man must be awakened and utilized before the philosopher's stone or the elixir of life can be discovered." End quote. Beautiful. So that'll give us kind of a touchstone uh, that we can talk about this this mythopoetic journey, which is very, very real, but yet has been cloaked in images from myths, legends, fairy tales, sagas. And it embodies the aspirations of humanity towards a higher stage of evolution, which is probably needed now more than uh, in any of our previous ages as we begin to make a transition toward a higher stage of development. So true. And what she said is it has to be worked out on the astral plane. And the astral, of course, is that astral body of desires that we must learn to tame. And that is the first stage on the path of higher knowledge. Now, some of these references, John, as we've both made um, reference to ourselves, are sometimes associated with places even. But really, it's like the perfect example you used with H.P. Blavatsky. She created a cognitive approach to that place, to that invisible place, both consciously and through the way that you change your life, through your rituals. So John Dee, back in the 1400s, wrote 
that he wanted to create a universal reformation of science, art, and religion. And Blavatsky said the tenets of the Theosophical Society was to create a synthesis, a new synthesis of science, art, and religion. That's thinking, feeling, and willing, of course. Science in your thinking, art in your feeling, and religion, or what you do, ritual, what rituals you accomplish each day, those things that you do are what relink you, or religious means to relink with the, your divine source. And so she was trying to create this synthesis herself. So when we talk about the invisible college, it can be a, it's a philosophical, as you said, a, a mythopoetic approach to the spiritual beings that want to educate us. Now, when we talk about the astral body, that pretty much is on, our, on us. <laughs> we have to perfect the astral body, because if we don't, you're not going to get anywhere. You can't get to the etheric body after that, and then the physical body to transform them. And in the etheric body, many times Shambhala is referred to as the etheric realm, or Rudolf Steiner referred to it as the uh, a realm of spiritual economy. He called it the realm where even Christ, the etheric Christ, is appearing uh, in the realm uh, as an image in the angelic realm as an image, and Christ in, in the etheric is bringing the life back to the earth. So when we enter into this invisible college each night when we sleep, because basically that's what it is, when we cross the threshold between the physical and the spiritual, you can either do that consciously through philosophy, meditation, uh, poetry, art, or uh, and that, that is only at certain moments. For instance, a moment of inspiration in music could last you for the rest of your life. A, a poetic inspiration could last you multiple lives. So when you have these uh, actions of intuition in both thinking in all three, thinking, feeling, and willing, that is really when you're being taught by the spiritual world. That can happen physically for an initiate, even on this side of the threshold. But most of us, we unconsciously cross that threshold and we don't consciously meet the guardian of the threshold, or the other beings are there that are there at the threshold. But once we cross it, we enter into the realm of the planetary spheres. We expand out to the realm of Moon, to the realm of Venus, to Mercury, to the Sun, to Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Each night, well, let us say those who are highly conscious do, most people barely get beyond the realm of the Moon because of their astral body and their body of desires is not tamed. But if you could tame your astral body and get through the realm of the moon consciously in your sleep, then you could actually meet the beings who are there on the way back after you expand out to Saturn or as far as you can with your consciousness. When you come back, you actually receive intelligence. You receive spiritual intelligence into your bodies. And the more highly developed you are, the more you can receive, the higher you can go, the deeper you can go. And that is found in the human physical body. So wisdom is found in the human physical body, also in nature. And those were always considered the three mothers, or what Steiner calls three incarnations of the earth before this incarnation when we became physical, referred to as ancient Saturn, ancient sun, ancient moon. And now we're in the fourth stage. There's three stages to go. Those three stages will transform the three prior stages. So they're seen as seven pillars. Seven Pillars in the Wisdom, Temple of Wisdom. And that's what we did with our spirit.com. We created a digital Temple of Wisdom that also is involves the person, if you want to get involved in it, in your will, you can engage in the glass bead game. Now, the glass bead game was created by Hermann Hesse in his wonderful work, The Master Bead Game, or The, uh, the Glass uh, Magister Ludi, which is translated as the master of the bead game. And the glass bead game is a way to synthesize science, art, and religion. So whether it's Hermann Hesse or some of the other great utopian writers, Thomas Campanella, Saint, in his uh, description of the city of God or the city of the sun, and St. Augustine called it the city of God, Thomas More called it utopia, Francis Bacon called it the house of Solomon in his book New Atlantis, Again and again, even in modern versions, you have these pictures of the approach across the threshold. Once you get across the threshold, the approach to these higher realms. And they even describe these utopians 
that they wish utopias that could come to the earth, but they can't. They're in the etheric realm. So once you can tame your astral body, as Blavatsky says, then you can look into the etheric realm. And in the etheric realm, the seven ethers are the way that those very forces penetrate the human body. This goes very, very deep. We've written about it, and there will be other articles on the Our Spirit site with, that, with the newsletter that will be about the ethers and about Shambhala, so that you can have further expansion on these uh, ideas. But as John has pointed out, these things are so pervasive, there is no end to the depth of what can be said about the Invisible College. When I asked John to speak on this, he pretty much laughed and said, well, I'm ready to go right now because it's such a uh, pervasive topic. There's really no end to the depth that you can get into in trying to explain what it is that great, alchemists and the Rosicrucians referred to as the Invisible College. So, John, can you tell us a little bit further about uh, how you worked with that with the Tarot? Okay, well, I think it's uh, a good idea if one begins to think in terms of, of images. Like, uh, if you look at the cathedrals, the Gothic cathedrals of Europe. They're like, uh, almost like uh, tarot cards in stone in that they have all these various images relating to the passion of Christ and the lives of the saints. And, and there's a whole storyboard that when you were being guided through it by one of the, the monks there explaining it to you, he would take you before a stained glass or a, or a fresco, and he would tell you a story that pertained to it so that you could gradually unfold in your understanding of what these mysteries were. Uh, central in that particular stream was, was Chartres Cathedral, and you have a whole group of, of uh, spiritual teachers that were involved with that great school at Chartres in the Middle Ages. Uh, so that you see in the tarot, you have your 22 major arcana that represent uh, the 22 facets of development. But before one gets into the 22, it's a good idea if one first approaches uh, uh, understanding the mystery of number itself. And when we look at the mystery of number, that's part and parcel of a, a path of initiation that goes back into time immemorial. It was described by Blavatsky uh, under the expression of the seven unutterable secrets. And Rudolf Steiner uh, referred to it as the seven great mysteries. And they go in a particular sequence. And any time one approaches any esoteric content, one can use these as keys to unlock various stages of understanding or application. Uh, the first mystery would be the mystery of the abyss. That's your cloud of unknowing, and that's the great immensity out of which we've all arisen. The second great mystery is the mystery of number, of which I just mentioned the idea of the geometry of nature and the sequence of events and so forth, time and space as pertains to number. The third mystery is the mystery of affinity. And that's the mystery of the astral, of sympathy and antipathy applying to old moon evolution. We're currently in the fourth stage, the mystery of birth and death, so that we experience a very concrete expression of birth and death in this physical existence on the present earth. Beyond this, we have to pass through the mystery of evil. And that's the challenge of being able to cast off elements of ourselves that are unusable, but at the same time working towards redeeming them. The sixth mystery is the mystery of the word. That has to do with the transformative powers of the Christ spirit. And then the seventh stage is the mystery of godliness. 
That's the future Vulcan period. That pertains to culmination of the seven stages of human evolution. Uh, as we've passed beyond the Earth as human beings, we move to the future Jupiter evolution, where St. Paul says, and ye shall be as the angels. Beyond that, archangel, and beyond that, archai. So that these things, while they appear very abstract to people that are unfamiliar with them, uh, they are the language of the Christ mystery. And that Christ mystery is the central myth mystery of earth evolution itself and as we find ourselves, it's through christ and us that we are un enabled to be able to evolve and find love through our relationship to others so that we move from the uh stage of the development of wisdom that brought us to where we are now, we can take this wisdom and bring forth this transformative application, which is what creates the context for love. That is just a beautiful presentation, John. Beautiful picture of the way those seven stages are actually felt as a human being. And your picture of the future, the stages Stage five, six, and seven, of course, Rudolf Steiner describes them as the fifth stage. Once you've developed, well, first off, the first three stages are the physical, etheric, and astral. The fourth stage is the development of the ego, the I. The, the high, there's different eyes, by the way. So different egos, it's called. But not egotistic, but ego as in the I am, the identity of the human being as a conscious thinker. That's the stage we're in now. And as we move forward, then Rudolf Steiner says that we would develop what's called the spirit self in the next stage, which John has pointed out, we then become like angels. So these things are far in the future, but what people don't quite understand is that all of those forces are available to us right now. When you go into the invisible college, when you go into the realm of spiritual economy, these things are archetypes that you can encounter. Some of them are living beings. Some of them are living archetypes, but you work with them and you build your own hut in the spiritual world, your own home, your own domicile. Some would say once you develop that perfectly, it then becomes a temple, a temple of wisdom. And it's based upon the temple of wisdom of your own physical body, which are the gifts of those hierarchies of the past that have built wisdom into our body so that once we can read it, then it becomes an education tool itself. Our body becomes that temple of wisdom. And as John says, we transform from the realm of wisdom. And if you have gratitude for that wisdom, then you actually develop love immediately and joy uh, as the outcome of the depth of appreciation for the wisdom that's all around us, that has created us, that has given us our life, even our consciousness. So as we go in the future, we now have to develop from the human realm into the angelic. So these realms, the next step is a very long period of time, but the seeds for that step of going from the consciousness soul, which is the third and highest spiritual element of the three soul aspects of the human being. Rudolf Steiner describes the being of the human being, the constitution of the human being in many different ways, sometimes threefold, sometimes five, seven, nine, I'm going to refer to the ninefold human being. That's the physical, etheric, astral. And then in the soul realm, there's the sentient soul, intellectual soul, and consciousness soul. Human beings develop over time to be able to understand, comprehend, and use those aspects of the human being's constitution. So right now we've developed to the point of working on the consciousness soul. Well, the consciousness soul has a spiritual aspect to it. And once we develop that, we can reach up into the spiritual world, somewhat into the future, and pull down the forces that John is talking about, the angelic forces that of what Rudolf Steiner calls the spirit self, what Pavatsky calls manas, or monasic thinking, what Rudolf Steiner would call imagination, but not just simple imagination. We're talking about angelic imagination, where the human thinking is raised into the highest of realms and actually starts to become somewhat eternal. 
because it's associating with these living uh, archetypal beings. So that's the spirit self. But we also have elements of the life spirit and what Rudolf Steiner would call the spirit man, or what Pavlovsky calls manas, buddhi, and atman. Steiner calls spirit self, life spirit, spirit man. I like to say spirit human myself, but there's different ways to say that. Those are principles of the future, but those principles can come into us now. When you have an intuition, you're tapping into the atman. You're tapping into the spirit human. When you have an inspiration, you're tapping into the realm. That's the realm of the archive. When you tap into an inspiration, you're tapping into the realm of the archangels. That's life spirit. These things exist in the future. They're coming to us out of the future. And when you tap into the higher forces of imagination, the angelic realm, it actually comes to you. It's a part of you that is building you, but it's already there for you. It's a tremendous mystery to be able to understand these things. They're also called, the one of them is called the Akashic Ether, which is the realm of spirit self. And the other two are called the Tree of Life. They're the redeemed chemical ether or sound ether and life ether. These are very real forces that have been donated in time and space by hierarchical beings for our own use to build an invisible temple, taking our human body, our physical human body, and developing supersensible organs that can see into these invisible realms. And we're not talking abstract here. The other day, I heard someone describe this, and it's so beautiful to simply say, and that's why there's a reference in one of the posts that this is going to be part of, is that, well, first off, let me just say this. In the consciousness soul period, Rudolf Steiner said we're supposed to study the Kalevala. We're supposed to become a smithy, a forgeman, a someone who hammers, works with fire, and you're supposed to create the Sampo. And the Sampo is this magical mill that spins and has many colors coming off of it, and it produces salt and meal and gold. And by meal, that means food, but also all things that grow to become food. Salt, meal, and gold. Well, that's thinking, feeling, and willing when they're redeemed. So no matter what image you use from whatever religion, from whatever mythology, the epic of the Finnish Kalevala is the very epic that Rudolf Steiner said we're supposed to study in this time of the consciousness of soul so we can develop the spirit self. But what is that story? It's about developing relationships. It's about loving. It's about how do you learn to love? How do you love yourself? How do you love those parts of yourself that aren't very nice? And then how do you find a mate? But not in the story it refers to the maidens of the... Uh, northern rainbow the daughters of old lohi so that the three great heroes want to marry one of those maidens of the rainbow which is the etheric realm so how do you tame yourself through love and relationships and then how do you attain the rainbow maiden how do you attain the etheric realm how do you learn to see into the etheric realm because when you do as john pointed out in that sixth de- realm of development It's Christ that you encounter. And that is what the Rainbow Maidens are. They are these beautiful beings of archetypes that lead us to the living etheric realm. And this is not made-up stuff. The ethers, light itself, is invisible. The ethers are invisible. Warmth, light, sound, and life. All of those things are invisible. Light itself, When, as I was getting ready to say earlier, someone had pointed out, Uh, that the woo-woo talk of Cliff High about light is invisible and that when you go out into space, you you can't see stars. You only see stars because of atmosphere. You don't even see the light of the sun. It's a completely different experience. So what is light? Light is invisible, but everything that it contacts, it illuminates, it educates, it brings forth, it details. So light itself, warmth, light, sound, life, these are the ethers. These are the future. These are in your body. These are as close as you could possibly be to the spiritual world is simply to either meditate and go into the spiritual world consciously or try to go into the world conscious, uh, spiritual world consciously when you go to sleep at night or when you die. It's all the same realm. 
These are the realms of the interpenetrating spheres of the hierarchies. They are not imaginary forces thought up by uh, spiritual uh, uh, woo-woo pseudo-theosophists. No, these are very, very practical things. Uh, But they had to be held in mystery before, and now they've been revealed. But people are too busy. They don't have time to actually look and study the ethers. But if they did, they'd find that everything in the universe is found in the human body. As long as you look at the human body as it develops over its entire evolution, then you actually find the universe. The microcosm of the human body is an exact copy of the macrocosm. And that's really what the Invisible College is about, turning your own body into a temple of wisdom that can then illuminate these future stages, which you have already in your body as uh, future capacities, organs that can be developed into what Rudolf Steiner calls supersensible organs. So I know, John, you have much experience with this, especially I, I know you're a lover of the Kalevala uh, also, so I threw that in just for you. Not many people know about Rudolf Steiner's reference to the Kalevala. Yes, well, the, again, uh, various people will have affinity for the mythopoetic content of one culture or another. It's uh, generally considered in the, in the Great Brotherhood, that it's easiest for people to work through the archetypes of their native culture. And uh, that's part of the challenge that we live in today as this encroaching uh, technotronic globalism is attempting to try and, and remove all the cultural content and homogenize mankind so that what we need to do is we need to to bring to the surface these powerful archetypes of our traditions and christen them and by christen them i mean that we have to make them uh, a living part of our content and they they serve as riddles and and by contemplating these images and myths and mysteries and legends it enables us to access a relationship to the supersensible world that brought them forth and like when i wrote my book uh, or my books two of them i utilized the great teachers of mankind as much as I possibly could. And I have a lot of references and quotations. And I look upon it almost like it's a, a phone book of sorts. In contemplating these great beings, you're building a bridge to those beings. And the super sensible world that guided them uh, can find a bridge to you through your coming into contact with the teachings of those teachers that have been touched by this uh, mother lodge of humanity. And so as long as you keep your focus toward that great goal of being able to uh, work out of the Christ in you, uh, you may make mistakes, but you will never go wrong. Well, John, that's a brilliant point, and I'm going to ask you this question once I frame it a bit. In Rudolf Steiner's teachings, he points out that even the bodhisattvas join together in the etheric realm, and that it is out of that etheric realm that they nourish themselves, and they must go back there, and that they're basically centered around Christ, and that there's 12 bodhisattvas. There's also references to the 12 apostles, of course, on the earth uh, around Christ. There's also uh, the mysteries of, like, the Gottesfried von Oberland and the 12 people there, or as Rudolf Steiner points out with Christian Rosenkreutz and his initiation, there were 12 great masters there. So the question is, Blavatsky said that there were these masters and that she said she met some of them. And now the anthroposophist would say, no, there's really no masters. But of course, Judith von Halle now says Rudolf Steiner was Serapis Bay. He was one of the masters. Others say he was... Christian Rosenkreutz, of course, we know that he said in some of his writings that he had met the master. So the question is, in all of this searching for the path to Shambhala or the path to the Invisible College, these masters, what about these masters? Are we going to meet any masters physically in this day and age, John? Well, actually, I think that many people already have. 
They just weren't aware of it. And uh, you may meet them as a particular being uh, in a current incarnation, because some of them are incarnate and some are carnated. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, the spiritual world is, is very, very resourceful. So that you may see the workings of the masters in someone that you encounter, unbeknownst to them. Uh, these types of, of beings and forces are, are present, and they become unfolded to you in a greater capacity as you work towards your development for the sake of mankind. One of the greatest association of the masters that happened uh, was uh, that Rudolf Steiner makes reference to, and it, we only know about it because Aaron Fred Pfeiffer, uh, who had, was a, a young student uh, under Rudolf Steiner and Aaron Fred Pfeiffer, who was the, the author of most of the content of biodynamic gardening. And Pfeiffer had shared in, in some of his uh, talks regarding a conference or a coming together of the leaders of mankind, these great initiates, in the court of Queen Hatshepsut, the Egyptian queen of the 18th dynasty. And uh, her, she was Queen Regnet uh, Hatshepsut Ma'at Kare, and she reigned around, from around 1473 to 1458 BC. And Rudolf Steiner had said that the masters of wisdom all incarnated in her court at that time to bring about a coming together in preparation uh, for the incarnation of Christ. And out of that, the, what would culminate in the grail mysteries. Included in her court uh, was this one interesting individual, Sinanmut. And Sananmut was a commoner, but he rose to the highest levels within the court of Queen Hatshepsut. And uh, Rudolf Steiner had indicated that he was the incarnation of that great leader of mankind that, that dwells above the other masters of wisdom. He's like the, the principal master of wisdom, a Manu figure. And this Hatshepsut, uh, as a queen, it was extremely unique for for a queen to rule a kingdom, but nonetheless she did. And Senenmut, or Senmut, he's sometimes called, was responsible for a great deal and was a tremendous genius. And his tomb it was the first of the uh, archaeological sealing tombs in Egypt. And so he... Uh, as we could see from that tomb, it had a great deal to do with bringing about the, the uh, further development of the star wisdom within ancient Egypt. And we also know from uh, Hatshepsut's tomb that he designed in the Valley of the Kings, that he was very much uh, into a cosmopolitan impulse the scenes in her mortuary temple show her making the great expedition to the kingdom of Punt to the south, which would be down towards Ethiopia uh, and making exchange uh, in commerce, that it was a, a, a impulse, not so much of warfare, but of commerce. So it was a cosmopolitan impulse that was being developed out of this. And it's, it's something that's an image that one can meditate on. One might not quite know what to do with some of these things. These are things that you hold in you. The, the, the way one of my teachers who used to sell peanuts at Tiger Stadium, and he said, well, you know, there's, there's this temple of wisdom, it's, and it's surrounded by a courtyard. And then outside the courtyard, well, that's the barnyard. That's where we are right now. <laughs> that's for sure. Well, John, Rudolf Steiner talks about the call of Christian Rosenkreutz, which basically means he calls you in a variety of ways, but one way is to kind of touch you and warn you and save your life. 
and then you feel called. And there have been many people described that they had this experience where they felt a tap on their shoulder and someone said, get off the train or move or whatever, and they did, and it saved their lives. So some people are called that way. Um, and then, of course, right now we have, so that's kind of a etheric, not a very much of a physical way, but because Christian Rosenkreutz can manifest in multiple places at one time because of his consciousness, he can help. So Christian Rosenkreutz usually um, intersperses their incarnation, his incarnation with the Master Jesus. So every hundred years, Rudolf Steiner says, one or the other incarnates. So we know that that being is always, one of those two beings are always around. Then Rudolf Steiner says that um, the Maitreya Buddha would be incarnated around this time. He also insinuates that the Kalki Avatar and others say that that's true. And of course, uh, some of the Eastern traditions say that that's true. So we are told that right now, also Rudolf Steiner says, many, many, that the spiritual world is empty. Everyone's incarnated. And that the group of 12, the two groups of 12, that both of them are incarnated. So according to what I can figure out, it seems as if we are surrounded by masters all over the place. So we wrote um, uh, a piece about that and about what that's like, whether you could actually find that call of Christian Rosenkreutz already in your own biography, and that, you know, it drew you to the Invisible College, or whether or not you've had encounters. And in that article, um, I describe a few encounters with beings that, they were mystical beings. I, they seem to appear out of nowhere go, <laughs> and go back into nowhere, uh, you know, just astoundingly filled with love. And I've often noticed that when I've been in the presence of Mother Teresa or the Dalai Lama, or uh, Ma, uh, Teresa, Mother Teresa, da Dalai Lama, uh, Guru Ma, whoever it was, all these different wonderful beings that you're just filled with love and that you can't think of any questions. <laughs> so you'd think that when you get to the Invisible College, you're just going to have question after question after question, and these spiritual beings are going to teach it to you. But in a way... My experience of it is the wisdom is they embody the wisdom and it's love that comes out of them. And most of the time, I would say every time that I've ever met a truly highly developed being, they seem to have the best sense of humor and they laughed a lot and they were just filled with joy. They didn't really, they could teach all this profound wisdom and history and so on and so forth. Uh, like Gaelic Rinpoche, who has recently passed, who's the teacher of the Dalai Lama. Uh, he, would, he had infinite wisdom, but that's not the impression you get from a being like that. The impression is they're filled with wisdom, and you love them, and your questions dissolve before their love. So when the theosophists and many um, of the writers in the theosophical movement wrote about meeting the masters, they kept exaggerating about going here and going there, and traveling to this place and that place to go meet the masters, whether it's the Transcaucasian masters or the, the Tibetan masters, or to meet uh, um, you know the highest teachers. Well, the highest teachers of the Tibetans are now in America, and so what we have is that journey to the east, as uh, Herman Hesse calls it in his book, that journey to the east, or even what Emerson was talking about, you know, uh, going towards the light of the east. I'm not sure that applies anymore. I think it's all around us, and I'm not sure masters are going to uh, appear on your doorstep because I think they're going to stay pretty hidden in this day and age when evil is so rampant. What do you think about that, John? Well, it's interesting because uh, people tend to have uh, an antipathy that shields them from self-discovery, and they want to disassociate them from things for which they don't have an affinity. And uh, it's interesting that, that Jesus Christ spent most of his time hanging around with, with sinners and criminals and people that were fallen. And so you see, that that's the, the dilemma. And I really like the way uh, it's been put together by uh, the poet Alfred Lord Tennyson in his poem, The Mystic. And he says, angels have talked with him and showed him thrones. Ye knew him not, he was not one of ye. 
He scorned him with an undiscerning scorn. You could not read the marvel in his eye, the still serene abstraction. He hath felt the vanities of after and before, albeit his spirit and his secret heart, the stern experiences of converse lies, the linked woes of many a fiery change had purified and chastened and made free. How could ye know him? Ye were yet within the narrower circle. He had well nigh reached the last, which with a region of white flame, pure without heat, into a larger air of burning, and an ether of black blue investeth and engirds all other lives. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, that reminds me, you know, because that's about the passion that it takes to get there. In the Norse mythology, Odin gets all wisdom, what you could call, you know, he goes to Shambhala, but he has to pluck out his eye and throw it into the well of Mimir. And then anytime he looks into that well, he gets an answer to any question that he has, so he has all wisdom. And his wife, Frigg, she goes to the base of the Yggdrasil, the world tree, and she goes to the Nornies, the three Nornies, um, uh, Skald, Erd, and Verdandi, and, and she goes to Erd's well. And so the god and goddess of the Norse, which is Odin and Frigg, sit, to sit together on their throne, and they look down upon humanity. And through the well of Mimir and his ravens, Odin has the ability to know what's going on in the earth and have the wisdom. But then Frigg has the wisdom of Erd, which knows the, the future. So they sit and they gamble on what's going to happen with humanity because it's not decided. We don't all have to become angels. Some of us may take a while to do so. Some of us may even turn not towards the light, but towards the dark. So it is about taming that astral light, as Blavatsky calls it. It is about that passion of the uh, a poem you just quoted, as well as the way that you frame this with Blavatsky's, uh, in the intro of this with Blavatsky's statement about all of us who are on the path. But you have to sacrifice to be in the path. And if you want to know the future, well, that's still up for human free will. So you transform from wisdom into love only through freedom. No one can compel you to love, and love is beyond you. Love flows through you. You don't uh, hold love. So if you're free and you let that free love through mercy and grace from wisdom flow through you, then you can uh, attain to love. And then like the heroes in the Kalevala, you can, fit, you can wed your etheric body. You can wed your higher self. You can wed the rainbow uh, maidens. And that's what our time is about. It's really about how do we handle the passion? How do we handle the astral body? How do we get beyond that so we can see into the etheric light? Because in the etheric body is imprinted the entire past, present, and future of the human being. It's timeless. It's a complete uh, mystery. And again, of course, all elements in the etheric body are invisible. But as we learn to see these elements, because we can feel their effect, we can feel their force, we can have a cosmology that explains how these things work. Really, that, that's what the Invisible College is. It's about creating a cosmology, a cosmology that shows where you're at in relationship to other spiritual beings and how it is that you can interact with them to move forward in your own spiritual development, human spiritual evolution. So I think it's important to remember that we do have to suffer. We still have to suffer. We, are the, we have not pulled the realm of Shambhala down into the physical, this is the realm of, of uh, evil, as you say, uh, for the future and fighting the questions of birth and death right now. So until a human being can get beyond the question of death and realize they're eternal, in other words, once you can cross the threshold into the spiritual world consciously and you can see that it's alive and spiritual beings are there and that the invisible college, that Shambhala, Tushita, Tushita Heaven, it's all there. And it's all there right now. This isn't something for the future. This is something that you can do presently. So for those who are experiencing this radio podcast for the first time in terms of looking at woo-woo, at spiritual concepts, we want to also make this completely practical for you. 
This is about taking your own organs, your organ of your heart, and turning it into a moral organ that can perceive morality, that can be that transformative place where wisdom becomes love. So this isn't impractical. This isn't uh, pie in the sky, uh, uh, excarnated anthroposophy or theosophy or some type of Lucifer worship. This is about putting the human being in relationship to the forces that they see in outer nature and balancing them with the forces that we see within ourselves. And so, really, that's the invisible college. The masters may come, but we have a lot to teach ourselves before we can purify ourselves so that, as John pointed out, even if you met a master who says you'd know it, you know, really, you could meet them and you'd never know it. One that I think was probably the highest being I ever met, I didn't know it when it was happening. I only realized after he had basically turned invisible in front of us, uh, I didn't even realize what was happening, you know, uh, because I wasn't prepared. So what we're saying to you is get prepared, get on the path, get a cosmology, whether you're studying anthroposophy or theosophy or, as John pointed out, whatever your cultural inroad is into the Invisible College, get on that path, study, work, pluck out your eye if you have to for wisdom, do whatever it takes. But once you get it, you're going to realize that wisdom is beyond gold and silver and diamonds and rubies, as the Bible says. Yes, that's that's a, a nice image, but I, I wouldn't recommend anybody plucking out their eye. <laughs> that, that, Come that on, kinda, John, you got to sacrifice. <laughs> that plays that plays havoc with depth of field. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course it is. Uh, it's an analogy, but in the same way, <laughs> the eye. What is the eye? The eye is the the, the pathway to the astral body. People yeah. love. They think beauty is what they see, instead of what they hear or what they feel or what they do. So, yeah, it's a pretty funny uh, image. And, and then, of course, once he plucks out the eye, he has to have two ravens that go, you know, to each direction, fly throughout the whole world, gathering information, intelligence, and bringing it back to him. And still he's not as smart as his wife because his wife knows the future. <laughs> well, if we, if we take it into a biblical context, uh, Jesus said, If therefore thine eyes be single, thy body shall be filled with God's light. So there's that image of the single eye that uh, is at the center of this working. And so if one can have the self-reference in the face of all the challenges in the world, then that's what's going to give you the ability to build this like spiritual hut that you refer to. That's the ability to have the shield of of uh, the anointment or the shield of seraphim that surrounds you that that you have already formed that rainbow bridge and and you are really not so concerned with worldly things other than as a means for helping others because you've grown into the understanding as an objective reality that you are an eternal being within uh, the realm of Christ. And so whatever travails one might go through in this world, and great they are, uh, wisdom is the fruit of suffering. And, uh, but love is the willingness to take up the suffering of others. And so it's, love is something that you give. It's not something that you're waiting for to receive. And, uh, but in the main, uh, it's important to keep a sense of humor because this world really is hilarious. That's a fact. In the Norse uh, legends, the old gods all die except for the one that's blind, and he's like the Christ image, he hurt, hurt her. And then uh, Vidar, the new time spirit, they cross over the new rainbow bridge with some of the children of the old gods. But there has to be a Ragnarok. There has to be a place where you slay the old and you look towards the future and you carry the very best forward. Because we don't take a lot from this physical world into the spiritual world. As a matter of fact, we take nothing of this world into the spiritual world. It has to be a completely new type of perception, new type of substance that you're working with. And so that image with the Norris, we have to look forward to that future, that the second rainbow bridge will come, that the new part in us, 
the spirit self, life spirit, spirit man, can then cross that rainbow bridge into the spiritual world. John, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. It's a revelation what you gave us today in terms of the approach to the Invisible College, and you always have the right things and the right quotes to say at the right time. So I'll close this out with you giving us some kind of uh, John Barnwell remark that will round this off. <laughs> well, I think I'll just laugh and, 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 <laughs> and know that I've enjoyed the journey. Thank you so much, John. Look forward to our next conversation. Okay. So long. Bye-bye.